Greetings, true believers, and welcome to episode 67 of the Polis Podcast, a bi-weekly show about comics, pop culture, and faith. My name is Chris Poirier, and with me, as always, though this time on the road and traveling because he loves going to conventions, Hector. How's it going, my dude? Um, mistakes have been made. <laughs> oh, no. I was being too thrifty with uh, my hotel choices for this con, and... Uh, Ooh. You know, it's not, it's not bad, but, you know, mis- mis- <laughs> mistakes were made. Not great. Mistakes not great. Were mistakes were made. Um, so, lessons with Hector. Choose your hotels for your con experience wisely. Well, dude, when you're here for three days, it, it gets pricey. Like, if it was a one-night stay, yeah. I'd be like, oh, let's turn up. Three days is like, <laughs> um, sure, the furniture is supposed to be moving. It's okay. <laughs> Oh wow! So uh, yeah, you're you're in lovely Richmond, Virginia for GalaxyCon. So uh, by the time everyone hears this, uh, you'll have missed Hector. But um, you know, think you'll about it. you'll have missed me <laughs> being at my stunning booth for three days, um, and eating at a wonderful Mexican Asian fusion restaurant called Wong Gonzalez. That's Ooh. Wong like Doctor Strange Gonzalez. And it's magical. It's actually one of the main reasons I signed on to do this show. And, <laughs> and not even kidding, my daughter and I came here uh, two years ago. It was actually the show we were at um, the first time I really heard about the pandemic. Jackie Craft, which is a friend of ours, um, yes. was because she was really big on news. She was li- So this was February 28, 2020, you know, like two weeks before air quotes right. the pandemic hit and she was standing around saying you guys this whole thing's gonna shut down in like a month like everybody's gonna be nobody like she literally looked at then um 12 year old rosa she's like i hope you're gonna be okay going to homeschool and <gasps> like uh she's like yeah you're not gonna go to school for like at least a year um everybody's gonna be she literally like prophetically two weeks before everything went down laid out what the rest of our lives were going to look like for a year and it was crazy like um uh, just further proving to me that jackie is amazing (laughs) jackie is amazing um and i don't know if you know this uh she's officially stepped down from all things nerd celebrity and she's a youth pastor now (gasps) okay so uh, (laughs) side note put put a pin on in it because this is like a long intro for us but it's great because you're on the road and we're doing like the live semi-live thing from from the con circuit um yes. but uh put a pin in it uh we, we need to have jackie on for lots of reasons all the reasons um we, we we should we will look into that because jackie did really cool stuff in cosplay and other stuff but she just has a really neat story in general so uh remember the name fam because we're gonna get back to it so well i, I guess we should talk about the comics because that's what we're here for right comics yeah, comics. So uh, strap yourselves in and prepare yourselves because uh, we've got comic sign. Uh, better put the word out. Can't wait for the nerd out. Better put specs on. Better bring next song. I call handsome checks. Neon glow. Neon glow. Need a soundboard so we can pretend like we know what we're doing. Or should I just refer to. Should I refer? Yeah. <laughs> Should I refer to our non-existent, um, like in-person producer, <laughs> like like other radio shows do, and be like, "Hey, did you get that producer man? Play that sound clip." Nope, just us. Uh, so on today's episode of the Pull List, we've got um, a on the road type show for you. So we might talk about a little bit about that because um, saving it for <laughs> after the news. Um, Hector and I are growing incredibly concerned about <laughs> comics. Um, because the short version of this is uh, I spent this week on two weeks what I normally spend in a week. And it's because I didn't have stuff to buy. And it's not because it wasn't physically present. I literally looked at the wall and went, eh. I can't spend so, money on this. Yeah. Right. So um, we, we definitely got to talk about some news. There's some great news. Uh, I think it's great. There's some cool little nuggets out there from the last two weeks. And we'll talk about the books that did <laughs> or were worth reading. Sort of. Um, Sort of. Um, our favorite number ones, and I am, yeah, I, I got a doozy this week. I, I'm still kind of recovering from what Image did to me this week. And so, yeah, that slash this is the Polis Podcast. <laughs> Ta-da. 
Uh, yeah, it's good stuff. So, um, wandering into our newsroom, which is the place that we aggregate RSS feeds from Bleeding Cool and no one else. Um, <laughs> it's not true. We actually, I actually do look at a lot of different sources because I don't need Rich Johnson telling me everything. If you know, you know. Uh, but... Oh, of course. My first my first thing is from Bleeding Cool, so I lied. Sorry, Rich. We love you, kind of. Um, Black Adam is going to come out this year, right? some point. DC just moved their slate around, so I'm starting to lose track of what's actually coming out and what isn't. But Black Adam is coming this year, right? Yeah. Wait. Yeah. Um, yeah it's uh, <laughs> So what they're doing, I want to say it's uh, Black Adam is October... And Shazam 2 is going to be Christmas. I think uh, Shazam 2 took the uh, Aquaman time slot. Yes, because that one got pushed like March or something in the next year. And personally, I wanted those two to follow back to back anyway. Just for... Mm. Because I'm sure we're going to get, you know, some Shazam Lee stuff at the end of Black Adam. Right. And we'll probably get some Black Adam in Shazam 2. So... We'll get all of we'll get all of the things potentially. Yeah. Um, so, um, comic book publishers being what they are, we're getting a new solo Black Adam book from DC about mid year, around June, and Christopher Priest is writing, um, and Sandoval is doing art, and it looks kind of old school. Like I don't know how else to describe it except that it lit. Like looking at the cover, I was like. Is that an 80s book? No. I, it, yeah, I was going to say it looks like some 1980s comics. Oh, and, and mad props because I'm now staring directly out at it. Um, our, our dude Cully um, did that cover. Nice. And he's a cool dude. That's another dude. Add it to the list. See, we're making a list. We are going to get back to interviews, we promise. Just finding finding people and uh, organizing schedules can be a thing because now that cons are back and everything, uh, the the folks got to go make them them monies. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna tell them that was a really good <laughs> cover because it, it gave me the old feels. But yeah, a standalone Black Adam book, which it's been a hot minute uh, since we've gotten just Black Adam. So if you're into the whole. Shazam, Shazamly, I can barely say that word, um, and just everything that's going on in that side of the DC universe, you know, this summer slash fall is looking really good for, for everybody, so uh, get ready. If if you're into it, there's stuff that coming. And um, if you really like Black Adam, there's a hip-hop album called Marvel Stash oh. Us that is a Black Adam slash Shazam uh, themed hip hop album that's also got some Jesus in it, and I am a voice on one of those tracks. So I don't you're, rap. You're... <laughs> <laughs> I do rap, you know, but I, you know, I keep them bars. But, um, right, and but, another one, and another one. No, um, see, I'm like you know, like on old school songs, like it was a what is it, Deathbed with Reliant K. John Foreman mm. is the Jesus voice at the end, like <laughs> giving the invitation or whatever. Um, I'm I'm the voice of you know spiritual wisdom at the end of a rap track. That's kind of interesting. I don't know. Uh, just one of those crazy comic book connections. Like as a dude I met at a con, that's a rapper who's like, "Hey, yo, do this." I'm like, "Okay." okay. <laughs> I got so, you, fam. <laughs> which is fun because uh, you know how, like, with virtual cons right now, um, yeah. Well, how, well, back when cons were doing more virtual meet and greets, a lot of them mm. are still doing it. But when cons sure. weren't meeting, they were doing like you pay your hundred bucks instead of just getting a signature and a picture. You get fifteen minutes of direct discussion time. With oh, somebody. right, right, right. So the guy who did this Shazam album, this is his name Richard Cutright. Um, yep. uh he paid for the t that time with Zachary Levi. Nice. And uh, when his time popped up, he was in his like cut right was in his full rap Shazam costume and performed huh. his music for Zachary Levi. Oh wow! 
And how did that go? You know what, pretty, you're pretty good. Uh, you, Z, you Levi set it said up, that so. Levi uh, added him on Spotify while he was on there. So it's gonna. That's cool. So somewhere on Zachary Levi's Spotify playlist is me. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas to yourself? <laughs> Slash I don't everybody. Know. I mean, it's fine, but that's it's still neat. Yeah, it's neat. Um, but Black Adam. I, I'm not. <laughs> um, so Zach, I really, if I might listen to this podcast, you don't know. You don't that's know. That's true. <laughs> hey, what's up, my dude? Um, like and subscribe. Add us, please. <laughs> um, in terms of the big two and randomness of movies and everything and schedules popping around and everything, it's probably of note that there's probably lots of Marvel news and MCU news for this year because let's just say 2022 is going to be kind of a lot superhero heavy at the movies. Um, there's just a lot of stuff. Um, and that means that there are lots of rumors. Shocked face. Um and everybody's still trying to decode everything from the Multiverse of Madness trailers that we have. And per the usual, press uh, releases to major magazine sources or other news feeds and everything occasionally will include details in like the sub credits of photographs and other things. And so here I am just to make your head hurt and go, hey, yeah, so that thing is a thing because... Some random magazine published a photo you've seen, but it included in the text that it was Doctor Strange standing before the Illuminati. Ooh. Yes. So, um, I'll, I'll, I'll do my own production thing here and pull up the article um, so I can tell you where it was. It was Empire Magazine. Um and in the notes of the same thing where we think we get Patrick Stewart's ear, right? Um, they're like, yeah, Doctor Strange, um, top to bottom, uh, Benedict, Wong, et cetera, returns as Sorcerer Supreme and lots of other random names here. But it talks about that here. Strange stands before the Illuminati. Which, honestly, a bunch of people sat there when they saw that the first time and went, it's the Illuminati. It's absolutely the Illuminati. Yeah, yeah. They did um, the whole uh, once, upon a time, or once Upon a Time in Hollywood meme. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are. Um, the Illuminati are jumping into the MCU more likely than not. So I thought, besides the fact that this is random news, that the other part of this is that a lot of people probably have absolutely no idea who the Illuminati is, in this context at least. We've all heard, you know, tinfoil hat, Illuminati, that kind of stuff. But what is the Illuminati in the MCU, right? Or Marvel in general. And here's what you need to know. Now, obviously, we don't know if MCU is going to maintain its canonical structure, but there's a lot of stuff and little breadcrumbs that suggest that it's probably going to be. So, okay, let's talk Illuminati. And the short version of this is that Tony Stark, along with a bunch of other very powerful dudes from across the MCU and the multiverse, basically recognized that they kind of needed a brain trust to that they could be brought together in the times of the multiverse slash other things just being super complicated, that they could try to bring everything back together and just keep track of all the superhumans and everything and, you know, bring really big issues to them. So in Multiverse of Madness, it kind of makes sense that we're going to see these folks. So who is the makeup of the Illuminati? This is where stuff gets cool. Um, so Doctor Strange... Check. We've met that dude. Black Bolt. We from we met him, but we don't immortals? but we don't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> huh? Yeah, so inhumans. Um, inhumans, there we go. Charles Xavier, so we get our X-Men. Uh Reed Richards. So Fantastic Four, which means we're we're gonna see Reed soon. We're gonna find out. We're finally going to find out. Um Namor. Uh, the Submariner, who we have not seen in any context, but it is now highly rumored Black Panther 2 will include Namor. Um, 
Which there's still that legal stuff with the distribution yes. with Namor. Along yeah, with so Hulk. that'll be an interesting thing of if, you know, that is a movieism disappearance or if it will be an inclusion. And then here we go, Iron Man. But it's rumored, given the context of where we are now, it's potentially going to be one of the multiversal Iron Mans, which means that it will not be Downey Jr. Oh. Um, but we don't know. Again, we're we're doing the hey, we're we're kind of guessing now. But for those who like, well, why does this matter? The for me, you, you know, I read comics. The biggest I've read a comic. I've read a I've read a comic book thing. Um, the only time the out of all the years I've read comics, the only time the Illuminati's ever really played a factor mm-hmm. in long term storytelling is that they were the ones that sent Hulk into space for Planet Hulk, which led to World War Hulk. And it was their decision to ship Hulk off, and it just went badly. Um, So the MCU has already done, just circumstantially, everything the Illuminati did that mattered. Mm Mm-hmm. Because well, the, Hulk, Hulk, go, Hulk going off into space at the end of Ultron voluntarily did that, and then yeah, so it's just kind of like whatever. Well, they may they may connect us back. Maybe that was the Illuminati, and we're gonna get the, you know, we didn't we didn't know then, but they've always been there. Um, the oh, other connection, true. the other connection point is also um, Secret Invasion which we're getting a show for. Oh, and, you know what? Yeah, that everything. does make sense. Yep. So here's the thing is, you know, the intersection of a lot of the things is about to happen. So, yeah. Um, and it also, hopefully, it means, yep, that was Patrick Stewart. And it is X-Men. And we're finally going to find out where the Fantastic Four truly fall in this and who's casted for what. And they have to be sitting on so many secrets right now. Yeah. That I'm kind of excited. Like, the after credit scenes that are coming are probably going to be like it was in early MCU where you're like, what's coming next? I'm so excited. Um, Cause I am, I'm, I'm unapologetic. I don't care. <laughs> um, don't at me. So yeah, now you kind of know who the Illuminati is and why you should be kind of excited. Like multiverse of madness is already looking, you know, like end game level. And I don't think that, That's an understatement at this point, just based on the pieces that that's going to pull together and that that movie isn't technically even in the slate of how MCU breaks their phases up an endgame event, which makes me go, where do you go from there? So um, I'm kind of excited to see what they do. Well, Feige said in one interview recently that it's not going to be like endgame style focused for a long time. Right, right. Like like that everything's going to just kind of be scattergunned for a minute there you go well i'm not necessarily against that if they're doing this in the middle (laughs) um so it's pretty good stuff so there you go illuminati mcu lots of stuff Um, so it's gonna be iron man uh patrick stewart you know all those people plus most major american rappers and business people and it's gonna be great luma And, and lizard people what Never mind. Yes. Something different. Um, so I guess I'll stay on the Marvel note and loop back to kind of the things that the other things that are pretty interesting from this. Uh, for you Marvel fans who are trying to figure out what Marvel's big thing is this year, we talked last time a little bit or time before that DC's, you know, got Dark Crisis. So a crisis is coming this summer, you know, shock face um, on the DC side and on the Marvel side, we have judgment day. Um, judgment day is coming is what all the books have said recently. And frankly, I don't care <laughs> um, because the setup seems slightly lacking, but it's me. You know me. I'm not totally in love with Marvel, except I'm going to pitch you mostly Marvel books in my polls this week. Um, but this part is, it is a, an, X-Men versus Eternals versus the Avengers, basically. So if if you're into those three, mixing it up a bit, that's your summer event from Marvel. 
Um, yeah, that that yay. that block of yeah that block of silence right there is pretty much how I felt <laughs> reading like, that isn't article. That every well, it's one of my favorite lines from. This is a deep dive, but most things are. Um, mm. One of my favorite lines from Buffy the Vampire Slayer is like in the musical episode where mm. it's like Dawn's in trouble. Must be a Tuesday. And, <laughs> and, Here we and the, are. That's how I feel when it comes to superhero crisis books. It's just like, oh, it's another day. Like it's just it's it's what they do. It's what we do on repeat. <laughs> we get and super- here we are. And here we are. Surprise, shorty. Um, Except this book's gonna have thirty-seven variants. <laughs> much like Loki. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm I'm I, I am prepared to be surprised but i'm also prepared for it to basically be this <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely so we shall see um and so yeah good times but floating all the way to the other side of kind of the indie side um slash you know not big to side dark horse snuck in with an announcement over the last two weeks that made me go, go on. And more so, it was an announcement from Kevin Smith saying, hey, those crazy fools at Dark Horse decided to let me publish my own comic imprint, and I'm bringing back all of my old school comics um, that were part of all of his projects, so Clerks and um jay and silent bob and other independent projects and we're getting secret stash press from dark horse which is really dope yeah i was gonna say i kind of expected you to be slightly more excited (laughs) um i am and i've always enjoyed kevin's comic writing kevin without direction can lead to things like clerks too um (laughs) (laughs) or clerks three come on it's coming I have more faith in Clerks 3, and I, I don't know why. Maybe I was just in a bad place because a lot of other Kevin Smith fans really liked Clerks 2. Because I'm a Kevin Clerks, Smith fan. Clerks 2 hit different. I, yeah. I'm actually kind of with you on it. Because um, I really enjoyed the Jane Silent Bob reboot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Clerks 2 just never... And you'd think, adding Rosario Dawson, and maybe it was the fact that Rosario Dawson was ever remotely attracted to Brian O'Halloran, that I'm just like, <laughs> this is lies. It's like, I can't get with this. Uh, I, that honestly might be what it is. It's That might be why I'm like, this is shenanigans. Um, shenanigans. But, uh, yeah, so, I don't know. But I, I've when you give Kevin Daredevil, it's great. You give Kevin Batman, it's great. You give Kevin a clean slate. Uh, I mean, he also did great with He Man. So, yeah, Green Hornet. Know. Yeah, I, I miss like, the Green Hornet. But you know, um, he so I, Green Arrow back I'm for it. life for crying out loud. He gave us the Yelp. cool Batman chest thing. So I mean, there's there's a lot there. Yeah. So I, I'm at least cautiously optimistic <laughs> um, that we might see some neat stuff out of out of that house because it's I, he's kind of said, I've got some projects and I've got some people. So it's like, all right, well, I'm down. I want to see what happens. And that leads me to the bottom of the news pile where I want to talk about every comic book collector's favorite topic speculating no no yeah so i i have to i've i've titled this conversation how i learned to stop worrying and love speculation but that's a lie um and it's because we've reached the point that a handful of the comic book news resources are like here is your weekly top 10 speculation book and i'm like ugh. so speculation I suppose I should define this briefly here just in case folks don't know, but um, we are surrounded by a ton of content these days from Netflix, from HBO, from whoever, um, and movies. What happens is a lot of that stuff is based on original comic stories that came out recently, a very long time ago, et cetera, that a lot of it at least is built in comic books. Comic book collecting is generally around... 
Um, key issues. Key issues are generally your um, first introduction to a character, a death of a character, major event, major costume changes, whatever can be labeled first or last in something. And that increases the value of something. And with shows and everything, what's happened over the last, basically since the MCU became a thing, um, where we got a character in screen of some type for the first time, everybody rushes out to find the the first appearance or this particular appearance or this particular story and start buying that stuff. So it's like the stock market and, and that suddenly the value of these things goes through the roof. And then other people will hedge their bets that something might happen also and run out and buy a bunch of number ones of a book before we even know whether it becomes something or not, hoping that someday that pile of $5 comics will be worth a couple thousand dollars. Stop it. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, sometimes it does, but this is why I tell people collect comics because you enjoy them and pay the price that you are happy with at the time, and you will never be disappointed. If you speculate and you're wrong, you're going to be really disappointed when you pay $600 for a book that's worth five bucks two months later. Um, and that stuff happens. But here we are. Um, and this week is a week. Because normally what would happen is this would be like a book or two. Someone would come in and start digging through your back issues. And they would pull, you know, Amazing Spider-Man number 31.5 or whatever. And yes, points exist now. And that's stupid. Um, but... And they come up and be like, I am going to pay $2 for this, please. And it's like, why do you have seven copies of that book? <laughs> why did I have seven copies of that book? Um, and then you find out it's because there's half a panel of a background character in a movie that's going to come out in two months. And that book is suddenly worth $300 on eBay. So why am I talking about this week? Well, this week is because literally a couple places did their top 10 speculation books based on news or things that occurred this week. And that's a lot. Um, I don't know if you've paid attention, but it snuck up on me, but the Vertigo comic DMZ has an HBO show now. Yeah, with Rosario Dawson. Ros with Rosario Dawson. Um, Who's so. still not attracted to Brian and Halloran. <laughs> Valid. Point. <laughs> point made um so the first issue of dmz is now you know suddenly on this market and is going um graded versions of this book are going for 400 dollars, which is just broken but like raws are running in like 30 to 50 dollar range in a book that literally you should be able to find um dmz was a great series by the way um but it, it was printed in primary vertigo time where there there's You'll find this book. <laughs> um, there is, and this is where we get into like hardcore speculation, is Timeless number one, which I think actually came out as a third print this week and is the Marvel book that's doing like lots of different stuff, but has kind of like alternate versions of, you know, multi-version first versions one might say of books. But in this book, we have a female Black Panther with white hair that a bunch of people are like, oh, that's totally Storm in another universe, and Storm happens to be um, Black Panther's daughter in that universe. And recently we've seen Halle Berry with her Storm haircut, dot, dot, dot. Congrats, suddenly this book is worth money. People picking up what I'm putting down here? Because this, this is what happens. Um... So a few other things of note out of this list is the the Kenobi trailer dropped on Disney Plus, which looks pretty great. Um, but ye, in live action, we're finally introduced to the Inquisitors and the Grand Inquisitors. Well, guess what? Darth Vader number six um, is where we see the Inquisitors for the first time in print. Not the first time in canon, but in print. So now a random... Star Wars Darth Vader book um, that wasn't a key issue a while ago is going between a hundred and six hundred dollars. Um, so are you saying this is like a positive or a negative or what? Do you, what's your what's your vibe here? 
Well, personally, I mean, for retailers, it's great because when stuff's bad, books that you bought a bunch of because the publisher convinced you to, <laughs> um, could be you could literally make a couple weeks income on just a handful of those books. So I'm not against it from the perspective of, especially now where stores are still kind of trying to come out the other side of COVID and survive, that they're like, hey, I've got a pile of these books. Cha-ching! Um, and that's great. The flip side of it is speculators, as in the individuals that live in this space, to basically like buy and trade and sell speculated books. My personal experience is I've had a more toxic relationship with a lot of those folks from the retail side, more than a positive one, because they buy and trade comic books like day trading stocks. It's not a love of the thing. It's literally a buy low, sell high. And a lot of them will go into a comic book store hoping that owners are not up to speed on this so that they can buy a book that you have marked for $4 that if you were paying attention, you would have adjusted market value. And that just becomes a thing is you literally need to be in this position as a retailer of knowing all of this um, because you could miss out on selling stuff for what it's actually worth at market. But then you also run into the issue of some kid runs in and they just want to finish their Darth Vader run and suddenly the book in the middle of it's worth a hundred dollars instead of the four <laughs> that it probably would be in a back issue box. So I, I kind of have a mixed relationship with it as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then having been in a place where we had multiple stores, we'd also have dudes that would come into one of our stores in the morning and try to buy five issues of a book and then go to our next one and then our next one and then tell different stories to different managers just so they could get, you know, like 15 copies of a book. And that's why a lot of places when this stuff happens, it's a, you can buy a copy. And my subscribers are going to get first pick because they subscribe and support my store. So it's, it's just a really weird space. Um, but I kind of wanted to share that view for people because it is kind of a, it's a different side of collecting. Where you land? It's I'm okay with stores limiting copies and stuff like that, but it is just gross and toxic because it's you know what it is. You remember when uh, McDonald's put Pokemon cards in the Happy Meals, and mm. kids couldn't get Happy Meal toys or Pokemon cards because a bunch of forty year old nerds like <laughs> stole all the Happy Meals every day and all the right. toys and. You know, that, Stop that's, stealing joy, you joy stealer. And that's why kids can't pick up Pokemon cards because a bunch of old nerds are buying them. Um, which, again, shout out to the the people that give me Pokemon cards to give away at cons and stuff because <laughs> y'all are dope. <laughs> y'all are amazing. So, but, yeah, no. Yeah. But it's it's just another way that we take something good and make it a little too toxic and a little too competitive. And... There we are. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's just a thing. And because, like I said, because of new content, that that's what happens. And, like, some of the other books from this week are, like, the rumors of, like, third and fourth level characters on outlying seasons of HBO and Netflix and Hulu shows that haven't even dropped yet that people are like, yeah, that character showed up in half a panel in this book. And it's like, I, I guess. I mean, I, I do kind of like the part that it draws some collectors into the depth of comics beyond, you know, like primary characters that suddenly people are like, oh, yeah, I've got the first appearance of this dude that didn't even have a last name. <laughs> or they the costume, like, barely exists <laughs> kind of thing. Um Kite Man. Um, sorry. Um, it Always just is. A, yeah. So. Plus the trailer that dropped for uh, Miss Marvel. You know, I know that's yeah. gonna bump up a bunch of stuff. Yeah, and actually it is. And there. And here's the. Here's okay. So this is the last toxic piece of this, and it's why I'm. It 
it kind of rubs me the wrong way is knowing things like that now, Marvel is republishing or it's a second print cover, I think, that mimics an older cover that, you know, a lot of these shows try to get iconic imagery into them for comic book fans to go, saw that. Um, and so they're releasing, you know, a second print variant that is the sitting on the light pole um, image. So knowing that a bunch of people are going to go out and buy it and then try to sell it when the show drops as, see, it's the thing. It's on the TV. It's the thing. And literally two months after that, that book will be worth nothing. <laughs> It just bums me out. But, yeah, speculation is a thing. It's real. Um, and we even get it here. We only have a comic shop in, like, two hours of every direction from us, and people will drive down from Atlanta hoping that the collector base here isn't paying attention to buy up books from our little shop here in town. Like, happens all the time. Um but my dude's cool. He's like, that book? I don't know what you're talking about. And it's because he's got the pile behind the counter and he's waiting for his his regulars. <laughs> and I get that some collectors would be like, well, that's wrong. And I'm like, but again, regulars and subscribers are what keep comic shops open, not speculators. Um, that's just my two cents. And ultimately, that's what you need to know from these last two weeks. Um, that's a good look at the industry and us giving you kind of a peek under the covers of some comic book history and that other good stuff. Went a little long this week, but it's because we don't have a lot to talk about once we transition to the comics. So saving that for a minute later. But you can also join in on this conversation with Hector and I and a few of your other nerdy friends uh, on the Love Thy Nerd Discord and on their Facebook and we just would love to talk to you about what you liked, what you hated, or, you know, what we missed, um, because there might have been things we missed this week. But, you know, that's why we love the community that is comic book nerds. This week in nerdy news, this is LTNN. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe was the 2017 Switch port of the Wii U's Mario Kart 8 from 2014, which released with a ton more content included, such as more courses, more carts, and more characters, meaning this game is already a powerhouse of upgrades. So who would have guessed that five years later, Nintendo would be releasing 48 new tracks on the game, effectively doubling the course count? But that's exactly what they're doing, though not all at once. Wave 1 just hit this past week featuring 8 courses, all of which from previous games. Ones you would recognize from past console or handheld games are Toad Circuit, Chaco Mountain, Coconut Mall, Shroom Ridge, and Sky Garden. Plus there were 3 courses that are exclusive to the mobile game Mario Kart Tour, Paris Promenade, Tokyo Blur, and Ninja Hideaway. Now, the first thing you might notice upon gameplay is that these courses feel a little on the safe side. This is partially because these are the first two sets of courses, which, just like in any Mario Kart game, are the least tricky. This also might be partially because these courses seem to be the versions from Mario Kart Tour, the mobile game. As the next few waves arrive, we will see if this trend continues. In order to get these new courses, you must have the Nintendo Online membership with the Expansion Pack Edition, or you can purchase the Booster Course Pass separately, a one-time purchase of $25 that will unfold with eight new courses every few months up through the end of 2023. This will make the game almost 10 years old by the end of it all, yet even still, it remains one of the best-selling Switch games month after month and one of the best-selling racing games of all time. That was This Week in Nerdy News. I'm Radio Matt, and this is LTNN. You are listening to The Full List Podcast. So, transitioning over to that poll list, uh, Hector, tell us and the lovely people out there in listener land uh, what you did actually pick up off from that shelf that seemed kind of bare this week. Um, I'll say uh, most of, the st at least, um, two of the books that I are on my poll list came from Todd Turner telling me to pick books up. 
specifically. Yeah, um, that sounds about right. So shout out See? to Todd because yeah, community does the thing. He he does the homework for us. Um, uh, jumping in straight off to Devil's Reign number five, uh, which if you listen to the last pull list, that was the thing that uh, this was the book that got released out of order, or yep. that the Electra with Daredevil without Woman without Fear came out early either. Either way, these books were released out of order. Um, wow, and wow. this... So, if you haven't been following Devil's Reign, the short version of it is, Wilson Fisk has, because of his intricate paperwork, <laughs> realizes that someone has tampered with his memory. Oh, bureaucrats, man. Yeah, so he realizes that he used to know who Daredevil was, and now he doesn't. And... Uh... Uh, uh, because he keeps paperwork and that even though he's looking at the paper, he can't see the answer because magic or something. Um, at the same time, Kingpin is keeping Kilgrave slash the purple man locked up, using him to encourage people to vote for him in the next election. Um, <laughs> and I wish I was kidding that yeah. that's not the plot line, but it is. And apparently Kilgrave's got a squadron of illegitimate children that are running around being anti-daddy. And that but they also have powers because it's Kilgrave's kids that erased Daredevil's memory from the world. Right. And I don't I don't know when that happened, but it was before I was reading. Yes, um, no, quite it was quite a while ago. This this is um and I'm glad they maintained where that happened um, because I was going to say that because I've not been reading Devil's Reign. I know I told you all to read these books, but Devil's Reign didn't catch me as quickly as I wanted it to. Um, but yes, uh, the whole memory thing is, man, I'd have to double check, but it was I don't know if it was even in the previous run before Chip. It was not because um, uh, but it was a while ago and this is a this is a very daredevil thing of right everyone <laughs> he was much like peter parker he was outed and everyone's like oh dang and he kind of did the i to protect the ones i love i need people to not know that which is part of the reason part of the inspiration for how they did it with no way home yep um they took a little bit of daredevil's shenanigans and put it with parker's yep um so that being said, Fisk is gathering this information, and uh, like uh, during this whole storyline, Kingpin's son has been homies with Matt's magically born twin brother. Right. <laughs> um, oh wow! From some other deep dives, so you've got to have some deep Daredevil knowledge of at least a decade to even remotely enjoy this book. But then, uh, you remember how there's a superior. Spider-Man, where Doc Ock lives inside of Peter Parker, right? Um, yes. There's that a, happened. <laughs> th that does happen. Um, well, Doc Hello, Ock Peter. multiversed and pulled all the variants where Doc Ock lives inside other heroes. Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> um, so there is a Doc Ock Hulk a Doc Ock Ghost Rider, a Doc Ock Wolverine. Um, and so Doc Ock has his own team of superior everybodies. Um, that's the thing. <laughs> so you've got a six-armed Incredible Hulk that's actually Otto Octavius, you know, running around. Um, and this is where we're at, folks. Um, this is on my pulls. Just because I'm this far in, and you shouldn't, you, we're going to finish and, this out. There's only one issue and, left, and here um, we are. Here we are. But all this to say, you so you've got them and the Avengers fighting against everybody else. Um, and so there's some really cool superhero battleish things in here. But the reason why I'm bringing this issue up specifically is because on the last pull list, uh, I unknowingly outed the fact that you know daredevil according to electra number three was dead um yep. and and i'm not even going to label this as a spoiler i'm going to label this as a disappointment um Ooh. 
<laughs> because this is some middle school stuff. Um, like, because like this, this was something I'm pretty sure I said this on one of the recent poll lists that um, like they're not killing Matt um, when he has a conveniently hanging around twin brother that's not really doing anything. <laughs> Oh no! So uh, Wilson Fisk uh, re- re- eventually realizes that uh, through another magic stone that he just happened to have hanging around on his cane, um, oh. that he uh, he realizes that his cane grants wishes. Um, and so he well, that, that was a fun day at the office. Yeah, because uh, he wishes that uh, Mary. Uh, typhoid mary could get her memories back and she does and he's like wait what hold on she's like yeah, hold on and, and like gets his memories back and he's like mad murdoch and so uh i'll leave he, out he the, shook his fist right he did shake uh-huh. his fist he okay. did he, sh- he shook his fist mightily i'll leave out all the gory details but uh matt or Ooh. daredevil or kingpin goes to find uh matt murdoch and finds Mike Murdoch or whatever his name is. Um, Oops. And so that's a thing. Um, And you also, the, the issue concludes with uh, the Avengers, the, the auto Octavius Avengers (laughs) and uh, an entire city full of Kilgrave possessed people going at it. It's chaos, and it's nasty chaos, but it's moderately entertaining, <laughs> and, um, and it, it's it's the it's the best kind of comics confusion. So if you're interested in any of the stuff that I said to you, and you'd like, I need a I need a story where Doc Ock is a six armed Hulk. I need that. If, a, if any of these words have have brought you interest, you're welcome. So on the flip side, so that's one pull. Uh, yeah. Devil's Reign Five. There's one issue left of that. There is a de- my. Oh, I have to save this one for later because that's out of order. Never mind then. Um, so let's let's skip that. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Okay. Here comes the broken record portion of my pulls. Um, homesick pilots. Oh, I got uh, you, fam. I've got I've got a little bit of this too. <laughs> um, the, the, I, if you've listened to this podcast at all in the last t- year and a half. <laughs> I've said Homesick Pilots is minus like two issues. I thought Homesick Pilots was dope. Um, it's dope. It's, it's ghosts. Dope. It's kaiju's. It's punk rock bands. Um, it's dreadfully painful stories that borderline on anime sadness. And uh, you know, yeah. So <laughs> I'm not even going to spend a lot of time. I'm not even yeah, spend a lot no, of time me too. Homesick Pilots. Uh, read more comics. Yep, read more comics. Uh, um, <laughs> on, on more of the broken record, but less of a broken record. Um, Nightwing is also still really dope. Tom Taylor is doing good things. I still don't think the the books are currently up to the level of his leaping into the light single mm-hmm. trade. Like that's Chef's kiss, Nightwing. This is Chef's forehead kiss, but still good. <laughs> um, so, uh, but uh, Nightwing. 90 or right, let me let me backtrack real quick 1989 which was also hold up i said not 19 nightwing what? 89 uh yeah sorry brain for it nightwing 89 was the beginning of a crossover with uh S- superman uh son of kal uh you know connor um no john man there's so many freaking super boys um but <laughs> get it together I'm trying. They all wear the same outfit. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so Superman now, you know, John, you know, his son, John, uh, and Nightwing team up. And there's a really good story in, uh, the, the Nightwing 89 of how Nightwing rescued John as a kid and gave him a lollipop and, you know, did some good heroing. Um, so there's a single two issue crossover with a uh, Superman son of Kal-El and Nightwing. So it's Nightwing versus or Nightwing 89 and son of, or Superman son of Kal-El 9. Um, so I'm going to throw that one out there. Superman son of Kal-El 9 picks up the story cuz this is one of those books where I was like, you know what? I'm just going to read the Nightwing issue and not bother to get the Superman issue. And mm. that was a one where Todd 
like Turner said, pick this up. It's like a Nightwing story. And he was right. And it is. It's it's Chef's Kiss Nightwing. But uh, mm. it's... Uh, I just get so confused calling him Superboy or John or Superman. Yeah. It's just like, this dude's had four things in a year. So I'm like, what's happening? Um, but either way, uh, Superman is trying to battle some superpower people. And uh, somebody basically suicide squads a dude on Superman. Um and he's dealing with it really badly. Like he, this is a dude that dies in his hands as he's fighting him because someone else did it. And so you've got Nightwing just being comforting and coping. And like, he's literally got a, um, there's a panel that says, so I know there's no point in telling you to stop feeling guilty, but I will sit and drink tea with you. So you don't have to be alone with it. And it's them literally just sitting in his room so he can feel sad about what's happened. Ed, as Nightwing wears an approved by Comics Code Authority T-shirt, which is kind of cute. Um, if you the T-shirts in Nightwing and have been some of the best things, like a uh, Nightwing '89, Barbara Gordon is wearing a Teen Titans Go shirt. Yeah. Um, and uh, Nightwing is wearing uh, Batman pajama pants. So <laughs> all the things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it's cute. Uh, but anyway, uh, Nightwing 90 and Superman Son of Kal-El 9 are really dope Nightwing stories. Um, same writer, same thing. But in Super or in Nightwing 90, you get uh, where the previous issue was a Superman team up. This one, you get him with Wally West Flash. Um, and uh, basically... Nightwing's been has a price on his head and he's being hunted and uh Flash basically grabs Nightwing and puts him on timeout and makes him take a nap. <laughs> um because he hasn't rested because he's been on edge and all these things. Um but why 90 is good is because at the end of the issue setting up for 91 uh Nightwing and Wally come face to face with KG Beast who, if you're familiar with Nightwing's moderately recent history, uh, KG Beast is the one that shot Nightwing in the head and forced us to have Rick Grayson. Um, Dang it. <laughs> and so uh, Wally is very excited to get his hands on KG Beast. Fair. And uh, so there you go. Merry Christmas. That's my polls. And cool. I'll just say this, as Chris indicated, it was this was not an impressive couple weeks of comics. Like I looked at like I looked at what was online and did anything. I went to the shop and I'm just like and even I was reading through these piles, uh, a lot of what I read this week was out of obligation. Um mm. uh not out of enjoyment. And Detective Comics is really circling the drain for me. Um <laughs> And the but it's a weekly format, so it's a lot easier to get tired of it. Right. Um, well, that's what that's what happened with Amazing Spider-Man for me. Yeah. So there you go. That's that's my stuff. All right. So um, Chris's greatest hits: uh, Strange Academy number seventeen uh, from Marvel. Um, those those kids with their powers and they're not Hogwarts is still kind of great. Um, it kind of got lost in the middle there for a second, but I feel like it found itself in 16 again and 17 and they're kind of coming. I don't know if he's actually ending the series at 18 again, or if it's an arc conclusion, but it's said to be concluded at the end of, uh, 17, but they've really been kind of juggling some of the personalities of the kids at the school and everything. And there is kind of this interesting thing of like the internal ticking time bomb of they've had, they have a couple characters that technically are coming more from the villain side of things than the hero side of things. But this is the, Oh, their kids can be different and change and all that stuff, but they still deep down are who they truly are as a family. Um, so it's, it's interesting. So it's runaways with magic. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, dang it. Read strange Academy. (laughs) <laughs> it still it still <laughs> looks great and the story's wonderful even if apparently it's a Brian Cavon ripoff but fine. Um I don't think it is but 
it it it's not as pronounced as that um but i still love it uh seven secrets um number 15 we finally find out what one of the secrets is and i'm not going to spoil it because of, i'm sorry we find out what two of the secrets are the last secrets on the last page um and so this very colorful book from Boom just continues to kind of blow my mind that we've been talking about the the holders and the protectors of these secrets. Well, what the secrets actually are um, kind of made me stop and go, oh, this is suddenly going to get a lot deeper a lot quicker than I imagined because it was the concept that these were secrets that like could undo the world. Well, once you finally get introduced to one of them, you find out why. Um, so... If you're confused and you like really pretty kind of anime-ish type art, but really solid storytelling with a really crazy alternate future type thing going on, Seven Secrets, Boom Studios, Boom's doing lots of really good stuff. Um, Then I've got two more Marvel books, and they're both number ones because they were on the shelf and they were slightly better than the other things that were on the shelf. Um, Captain Carter, we get kind of our first... Um, foyer into the comic version and they kind of literally do a man out of time but woman out of time introduction Um, that it's you know the story that Peggy Carter becomes Cap instead of Rogers and it's you know placing her back into current day and time so she's going through the same thing of all my friends and family are dead all the things of my past are gone um so yes it is kind of a retread but it's a retread from a completely different angle and then it goes hard in the paint of she doesn't want to be captain but you know stuff happens the world keeps moving around her and they need they need a hero um and i didn't hate it um the art is on the edge of annoying me to be honest but the story kind of made up for it so i'm kind of etc um so definitely be checking that out if you're into the captain carter um what if slash you know multiverse type stuff and then my final is spider gwen got a a, a gwen verse um, type stuff so into the spider verse type thing going on and so same thing multiverse of insanity going on and gwen as ghost spider kind of jumping through um either universes or timelines it's actually not suit i yes question mark it might be both um but it actually was kind of fun um and I dig when books like this are fun, even if I'm kind of confused by what's going on, because if they're pretty to look at and action's moving and they're at least a joy to read, I am very okay with a comic book being picked up and me going, well, that was fun. And that's where my brain stops. There's nothing wrong with that. That's kind of why comics are what they are in the long run, is that it's a distraction, but it's a fun distraction. So if you're into the spider verse or into the spider verse type stuff and you want more about the spider Gwen, um, Gwen verse was actually kind of fun and I'm not sorry um, okay. that I had three Marvel books. So uh, yeah, you should be checking out all the things. Hey everyone, I'm Hector Mirai, and this is Faith and Fandom 180 on LTN Radio. So, one of my favorite things about the movie The Batman is the performance of Colin Farrell as the Penguin. Like, the Penguin's not my favorite character or anything, but Colin Farrell did, like, a seriously gangster job being an awkward gangster. And, you know, Colin Farrell's got a past involving superhero movies and bullseye wasn't like you know the best representation but uh you know what colin Farrell just did such a good job with this it was impressive the performance was like i don't like if you would have told me the penguin was going to be that cool and well done i just wouldn't have believed it 
But one of my favorite things about the whole experience was that after my kids and I watched the movie, I showed them a picture of what Colin Farrell looks like normally, and they straight up couldn't believe it. They just said, that's not who that is. That's a different person. That's not the same guy. And then, even more so, I showed them a video of him talking, and when they realized he had an accent that wasn't, you know, Penguin, they were like, that, that's not possible. How is this the same person? And, you know, I explained to them prosthetics, vocal coaches, dialogue training, stuff like that. But they said that he was a totally different person. And, you know, it reminds me of this passage in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, where it says, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. When Colin Farrell put on this new version of himself, people couldn't see him and know it was him. In fact, Jeffrey Wright, who plays Commissioner Gordon, didn't realize that's who he was in front of for a noticeable amount of time. Like, there's an interview about it where he just straight up was confused. He didn't think that that was Colin Farrell. And when we actually are living our lives out the way God calls us to, we should be such new creations that if people looked at our old dark selves, that they would not even recognize us. Because we have put on something new. Remember to catch Faith and Fandom 180 every Wednesday morning on the Back Row Morning Show only on LTN Radio. And if you'd like to learn more about Faith and Fandom, head over to faithandfandom.org where you can learn about our Comic-Con ministry, podcasts, memes, apparel, and book series. You can even read new chapters before they make it to the next book. I'm Hector Mirai, and thank you for spending the last 180 seconds with me. You are listening to the Full List Podcast. And so, as we as we wrap our time, as it's that time again, you know, starting to change out from my house shoes to my going back outside in my cardigan sweater. Um, what number one uh, jumped off from the very light rack this week, and you said, "Yep, that's the one." Uh. For me, it was Devil's Rain Moon Knight, which is, you know what, I, I looked at my life and said, I need more Devil's Rain. Um, but uh, Devil's Rain Moon Knight was uh, actually kind of delightful. Um, but Moon Knight's in prison because he got arrested. Because, Th- you know. That's, that sounds right. <laughs> they Because they, uh, because the Thunderbolts are, uh, you know, basically just reliving their glory days in civil war and yeah. um literally by the way the thunderbolts currently consist of u.s agent abomination um and some other douchey people but uh, anyway <laughs> Oof. um uh this issue is just basically moon knight in prison and uh we had a whole run recently where matt murdoch was in prison right and this issue's better than all of that. That <laughs> it was part of me why I was like I might come back to this because I, I, I like knew Moon you Knight. still had I know you still had PTSD from the Murdoch prison years. Um, yeah, right. And I was just kind of like, uh, especially it being a Devil's Reign um, connected story. I was like, I, I feel like I read this already. This has nothing to do with Devil's Reign other than the fact he's in prison. Awesome. Were they in the same prison? Is that the connection? No, no. Because you know, I, I don't know. Well, it might be. I'm not even sure, dude. Um, <laughs> Fair. But uh, but the the basis is that Moon Knight's in prison, and uh, people start coming for him, and he just quickly puts that to a to an end. And he, this is basically Rorschach in prison from the movie version of Watchmen. Right. You're stuck and, in here with me. Got it. <laughs> and then uh, it's it, <clears throat> he ends up uh, joining a fight club. Uh, he yeah, basically legit. finds that he, he, he finds wait, wait, that wait, wait, under- wait, wait. 
he he's Tyler Durden. Got it. Yes. Uh, well, literally and figuratively, he finds an underground fight club in the prison and tells the warden, "Put me in, coach, and get me a mask." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you get my Moon Knight with like a prison shank level mask in prison. The end. Ta da. <laughs> <laughs> so and every and he paints the walls red because and scene. <laughs> scene. Okay, yeah. So I'll go back and revisit that then because yep. Um, Moon Knight is basically just yeah that. That's What's why I I, <laughs> I kind of can't wait to see what um, Disney Plus does with that one because it's gonna be like yeah. uh <laughs> you know who Moon Knight is right? <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess both of our number ones are blood soaked. Um, so there we are. Um, I read images number one of a book called Slumber, um, and yeah, it's a thing, <laughs> to say the very least. Um, it's presented as a murder mystery, sort of, <laughs> that then goes into what would happen if Monsters Inc became a very adult broken story um so basically you get introduced to that there is the serial killer that appears to be taking over the minds of individuals and then these individuals commit murders and then basically do the serial killer thing of leaving a calling card at every scene that's identical. But the thing that ties them all together is the people that commit the murders all claim that they did it while sleepwalking and they don't remember it. So tear a page off from the front page of the newspaper. Um, what is it? There's a Netflix docuseries on this now, or there's a yes, handful there of cases where, where this has been a thing. So it's that. Um, and, but through that you get introduced to this company that helps remove nightmares and PTSD type stories from nightmares. And it's because like, no kidding, they've got the monsters Inc door that allows them to walk into people's minds. And what the, um, quote unquote, good guy, far as I can tell, good guys, good gals, um, do is they find out what's keeping them up at night and they go in and they murder the crap out of it. <laughs> And then they leave your dream and they're like, cool, you're fixed because it's dead. <laughs> um, so it's very violent. And like even the cover of the first one is like, you know, basically the fixer covered in blood. And the fixer has like um, a henchman, a helper. That's like this zombie slash cannibal that they don't explain why the person eats flesh, but they literally have a backpack full of body parts that he's like, I'm hungry. And he starts gnawing on a leg and you're like, I'm really confused, but okay. And then that thing questions the morality of the main character a lot when they're messing around in people's dreams and, and murking people's dreams. So <laughs> uh, where do I go from there? <laughs> But this is this story, and you kind of do get to the point that there's clearly someone else that is capable of jumping dreams, and that's how they're taking over people to commit the murders. And this person who's the fixer of dreams is like, I'm trying to find this person. So that's the setup is somebody's, you know, meat puppying people to commit murders, but they can call up a, a Monsters, Inc. door and jump into people's heads and... Um, remove nightmares. My money is on Steve Buscemi. <laughs> I mean... Randall! <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, but yeah. So, I've not picked up a comic in a while and gone, okay, that's pretty... I mean, you pulled part of this literally from the headlines, but th there's so many intricating overlapping circles here of pop culture with a kind of original idea that I'm like, yeah, I think I kind of want to play this one out, even though it's, it's super messy. It's super adult. Um, but I like comics that make me go, huh? And they're very firmly in the, well, that was a thing and I want more of it. <laughs> so I will see. Cause I, 
I've had Image do this before where the setup book is great and then you're like, cool, your setup was the idea, huh? <laughs> so we'll see if execution delivers on that one. So slumber number one if you're into an out there story. And uh, yeah, I, I guess I guess that's the show. I, I, I think that's going to do it for us here at The Pull List. Uh, episode 67 is now in the books and in your ears. Um, but we couldn't possibly do this alone. As many of you know, we take this epic journey of podcasts and fandom with lots of other amazing podcasts that are part of the Love Thy Nerd podcast network. So be sure to visit lovethynerd.com for more info, previous episodes, and maybe find yourself a little something new to listen to and add to your routine. But ultimately, Hector and I, we just want to thank you for choosing us as your primary comic book knowledge factory on a near weekly basis. So don't leave us hanging rate and review the show on your favorite podcasting app of choice we're on the itunes spotify stitcher radio you know pl places that you find podcasts and so i'm told uh so thank you and thanks for listening and remember kids read more, more comics, comics.